You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host, and today we get to talk about the importance of communicating if you're in the charity space. It's really important that charities have great communications to get the word out about what they do, to draw supporters to their cause, and to make sure that people who really need their services are aware of them and able to take part in what they're able to offer. And today we're going to speak with Lauren Lawson Zeli, who is one of the top professionals, in my opinion, in the charity space right now. And she brings sort of a, I would say, corporate button down and strong approach to communications. And we're going to talk with her about what that means for what she's able to deliver for the organization that employs her, which is Goodwill Industries, and talk about some of the other work she does in the profession to make sure that especially women communications professionals are at the top of their game. So Lauren, welcome to the show today. All right. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. So Lauren, first of all, what got you really interested in communications as a profession, first of all, and why the charity sector? Sure, that actually goes back to college. So I always knew that there was this calling for me to help, and I was studying to be a high school English teacher. And at the same time, I really loved to read. So I started to do internships at book publishers and started my career off that way. But it was about three months into my first job that I realized I wasn't getting the value, the intrinsic value that I received from a lot of the volunteering that I did as an undergraduate. I volunteered on weekends, but to me, I wanted that to be become a part of my life. And I started to look at opportunities in the DC area. I knew that DC is the capital of associations and nonprofits. And I communicated to my friends and family how I was feeling. A lot of the feedback that I got was, well, nonprofits equal no money. And there wasn't a lot of support around my choice, but I just felt that that was my my purpose and my higher calling. And for communications, there's so much that goes into that. And I wanted to do communications for a service versus a product. So as much as I I love reading, I love book publishing. To me, it was more important to put that time and energy and commitment into something that I feel passionate about and that I was doing a disservice if I wasn't communicating something that I could rally behind So that's how it all started. I I moved to this area in 2001. I've been here for 20 years now. And I started doing pro bono consulting for a number of nonprofits so that I could get that type of real world experience and then transition over to the nonprofit sector. Well, that's great. And I hear that story so much from people. Sometimes they'll tell me that they were working in the corporate world and having a great career doing it. And suddenly they did a volunteer project and it just changed their whole perspective. Right. Or some people say that, you know, I thought I would start out in nonprofits and work a few years and then transition. And they never do (laughs) because they find tremendous meaning 
in what they're doing every day. And it's hard to, to shift. I'm similar. I mean, I started out working in public accounting and one of my first clients was a nonprofit organization that I later became the CFO of. And it just took me down a path that I never regretted and always gotten, always have gotten a lot of value out of. It seems the same is true with you. And I'll add one other anecdote to what you said. It's funny to hear you say you didn't get necessarily a lot of support from family members who were cautioning you against working in the nonprofit sector because that meant no money. Um, I never, I never forget when I asked my, I told my mother who's now passed away that I was going to uh, work in a nonprofit world. And she said, well, how are you going to make money? Nobody makes money in the nonprofits. <laughs> and, you know, to some extent that's, that's a fair sort of orientation that people have because there's so many nonprofits out there that are just run by volunteers. Right. But as you and I know, there are some very large and medium sized organizations and some small ones too that do pay people. And it's important that they pay people reasonably well because of what they're trying to do. And your organization is one of them. The Goodwill Industries is an organization that has a legacy brand it provides great service to our society in a number of different ways, everything from job training to giving people who might not get an opportunity to be employed jobs that they can actually make an income uh, performing. And you also provide products and services to our society at a reasonable price. So right. there's so much that you're doing at Goodwill throughout your many chapters around the country. I thought we should talk about that and what you are doing to sort of be their national spokesperson and get the message out. Right. And just to hit on a few points, Goodwill has a 94% brand recognition rate, and that is due to our name and our stores. And we're celebrating our 120 year anniversary this year. We were started by a Methodist minister. I don't know how many people know that, but he started to collect goods around town and had people, immigrants, refurbish those items and sell them. And so when the social enterprise term was really became popular a few years ago, our message was, well, we've been doing this for 100 years, you know, now 120. And that's what makes us unique. We have a presence in the U.S. and Canada and 12 other countries. We have boots on the ground. We know the needs of the local labor market. We have 155 autonomous organizations, and they all run the stores and donation centers and the job training centers within their markets. So it, it's a federated model. It can be complex, but that's also the beauty of it because my international office here in Rockville outside of DC can't really dictate or understand or know the reality of what's happening in Milwaukee or in a small rural area. That's where we need our local Goodwills to, to really use their expertise. And that's what we hear from our program participants or people that are being trained and served. They really form these life-altering, impactful relationships with their job coach. And I really can't, maybe I'm biased, but I really can't think of any other organization that has that kind of special relationship where you, the, the secret sauce and the strength are the job coaches that are making the difference in the local communities. Well, you know, it's so important to make sure that people are aware because sometimes we think we know things, but we don't actually know things about what's going on in an organization or what it does. We may have a, an experience with a group that sort of sets into motion how we think about them. And there may be some misconceptions. Have you come across, in the case of Goodwill, things that people really don't really know about what you do, that you're always trying to get out into the public in a better way? We have come across misconceptions. So one is the idea that we're for profit. We're a nonprofit. Obviously, we we have our, our charter. 
We have high rankings from BBB, from Charity Navigator, GuideStar. So that's one misconception. There has been a rumor that states we have an owner by someone that has never been associated with our organization. And that rumor has been around for now about 19 years. It started off as an email and then it morphed into a social graphic. And I've done a lot of work to combat that with digital tools and resources. There's still some aspects of that that is out there. And then we just did a survey to research job seekers, shoppers, and donors. And it was interesting to listen to some of those interviews because in that people were saying, well, I'm not really sure what Goodwill does, or I I think they do good. So there is kind of that disconnect when you drop off your items There's the convenience aspect. We're located within 10 miles of someone's home across the U.S. So there is that that level of being accessible, but there still is the mission disconnect about what happens when you drop those items off and how more than 80% of the collective revenue goes right back into your local community. And that's providing certifications, credentials, job training, job placement. We have something called Excel Centers, which are charter adult high schools for adults to get their high school diploma, not their GED, but their high school diploma, credentials, and they have access to free childcare. We have one in D.C., and we have started this model where there are more than 30 across the U.S. So all of these fantastic, compelling mission stories to tell, but there's still that disconnect within public perception. Wow, that's unbelievable. I mean, I know I I didn't know about the schools. I knew about the job training, but had no idea that you were also helping people get their diplomas. And as you know, I'm sure that in this country, there's a problem with graduation rates and anything we can do to help people get over the hump and get their diplomas will dramatically improve what their earning prospects are and obviously their quality of life. Lauren, let me ask you this. The Goodwill, as you mentioned, has been around for about 100 years. Over that time, what's your estimation of the impact that you've had on this nation? That's a great question. So yes, we've been around for 120 years. We had a 2020 initiative to serve 20 million people. I know that we had exceeded that. And some of that was through virtual skills training, through virtual career fairs, through virtual mentor-mentee relationships, We had a site called GCF Learn Free where people can go on and access classes, English as a second language, math, so different courses. One other thing that I would point out is during the height of the pandemic, we had to pivot really quickly. And so we had more than 70% of our Goodwills were teaching online and transitioning trade classes, construction classes, other classes and courses to an online platform. And then we had to be very innovative and creative in our services. So we started holding drive through job fairs or resume reviews. So that's Goodwill has really been through world wars, recessions, trying times, now a pandemic. And we've had to really reassess in all of those types of situations. Well, one of the areas that we're most familiar with you is through the clothing sales and the opportunities that people have to share their no longer needed items with others. And what we've discovered, my wife, by the way, is a, is a, wardrobe strategist. And so she helps oh, I didn't know that. people deal with their um, unused and unneeded clothing. And 
<laughs> she's come across studies that show upwards to 80% of the clothing that we have in our closets we'll never use. Mm-hmm. And people tend to use the same items over and over again, and they can keep buying more and more that they don't use. So um, one of the things she does is she makes sure that people purge their closets from things that they don't need. And Goodwill is one of the places that she's able to get many of these items distributed to. Well, thank you. And it, makes a difference in many ways people don't think about it but it makes a difference for our environment right you know that we don't have these items just lingering uh, out there and more and more being purchased but you know the, giving people the opportunity to re-love clothing is a gift <laughs> you know it's it might be something that i no longer need but let's give others the opportunity to re-love it and i think that is one of the gifts that we have through this particular uh, mission that you all are, are, are uh, prosecuting right now. So uh, thanks for that. If you were to think about the, the size and scope of your organization, what are we talking about in terms of sales, in terms of employees and so forth? Uh, so we are a $6 billion organization and COVID hit us pretty hard because we had more than 97% of our stores closed at one time. And that varied, as you know, because of state laws, municipalities. So there was a lot of transition there. We had, we lost about 70% of our workforce. So right now we're rebuilding Across the board, across the whole Goodwill Network, we have 130,000 employees. I could give you a, a demographic breakdown, but as an example, we served 50,000 veterans last year, and, and we have all of those kinds of stats. We also served a million people in person last year. So that gives you scale. I like what you were saying about your wife's career because there's many reasons to give to Goodwill. We have the thrifters. We have someone who's environmentally conscious. When you think about the gallons of water that is used to produce new clothing, that's why it's so important to buy used clothing and used items. So Goodwill gives items a second life and gives people a second chance and we also recover the value in more than 3 billion pounds of goods each year from landfills. Wow. Did you say 3 billion? <laughs> 3 billion. Wow. That's that's a big number, no matter what you're counting. But to think that we're saving our landfills that much, and the water too, right? The water is a big deal when you're talking about right. making clothing. Right. There's a big reason why it's important to not only support Goodwill, but of course, there are several other nonprofit charities that run thrift stores like Salvation Army and Habitat. And we're, we're all doing the same thing for the greater good of, of helping people with disadvantages, people that are having a hard time finding work. And that could be anyone that's facing challenges. It could be a single mom, someone that was in a career for 20 years and is now looking to transition, people that lost jobs in the pandemic, youth, older workers, veterans and military families, people with disabilities. So we're, we're helping this, this broad array of the population. Well, Lauren, you, you obviously love this work. I can see the passion in your in your thought process and in uh, the way you communicate what the organization does and your your communication skills obviously transcend goodwill and you're doing lots of other work to drive the quality of communications in the profession and i believe you founded an organization or co-founded an organization in the dc area to kind of help with that right I did. So my government relations team co-founded something called Relief for Charities, and that's the number four. 
And I lead the PR side of that organization. And we started that, again, at the onset of the pandemic, recognizing that funding was going towards restaurants or the airline industry or specific businesses. But when you think about the need for nonprofits, the need for charity, we're on the front lines and we're helping people and we were not seeing the necessary funding come in at that time. And we, we really felt that we were in this triage and, and a lot of nonprofits were scrambling. So we combined forces with the National Jewish Federation, with United Way, with Salvation Army, with Big Brothers, Big Sisters, with Habitat. And I, you know, there are several that are part of this group. And I know I was having a conversation with you the other day saying, really recognized we should have come together sooner, especially as comms leads, because we do face similar challenges about storytelling or what's a priority or just the, how external factors are impacting our daily work. So that's the beauty that has come out of this. But we have also come together to have an editorial board visit with the New York Times and send out letters that came from our entire coalition to the White House, to policymakers, to make them understand the impact that the pandemic had on all of our nonprofits. We know that the Y had to shut down some headquarters and some services. So this, it had a tremendous impact on the work that we do, all of us, the nonprofit sector in various communities. Well, you're right. And it was so great when we found out that funding coming out of the federal government to support small businesses was also being available to nonprofit organizations to help them maintain their employees to also help with facilities that were going dormant and to keep these organizations afloat during a very challenging time with the pandemic. I mean, if you're the Y, for instance, or even Goodwill, you're so in need of those facilities. The facilities are central to everything that you're doing and having people not be able to use those facilities would obviously put a huge dent in what you're able to do and to, in some cases, really put those organizational processes and, and revenues and, and budgets in jeopardy. So congratulations to you and your coalition for appealing to Congress to make sure that funds were available to organizations in that really tight situation that they were in during the, the start in the middle of the pandemic. I know that there are probably organizations who could use that funding now. I hope that people will consider that as we come out of this to get everybody back up to the level that they were before. Um, I know that probably will be more difficult to achieve right now, but uh, maybe if you guys stay together, other good things can happen for nonprofits that we can all benefit from throughout our society. So again, just thank you for that. Right. Thank you. And I, the other point I would make is we all know in the nonprofit sector, what COVID lifted the veil on the inequities in our society. We've all had a lens into that, but I think probably the broader public did not. And so that really painted a picture to recognize there are inequities for women, for Black and Hispanic women, for certain populations. The pandemic, you know, again, really impacted women in terms of women leaving the workforce in droves. And so there was that, that impact that we still see today, but also just some things that we knew what was happening in our community with people not having access to internet and just how generational poverty, what the, the impacts of that over time. So that, that was really key. And I say all of that because at Goodwill, we started something called Rising Together, 
which is an initiative where we're combining forces with philanthropic companies, with Fortune 50 companies, with global businesses, with the intent that everyone deserves the opportunity to thrive. And again, we did that at the onset of the pandemic because there are companies that that want to find that solution. We we know that, and my CEO says that this as well, there's not a talent gap, there's a skills gap. And COVID only exasperated that. So we launched this initiative last May with Anthem Foundation, Coursera, Google, Indeed, and Lyft. And now we have more partners coming on board that will be launching this spring. So hopefully I can come on in, in April or May to talk about this some more. But I share that because we we have a commitment to ensure that 1 million people have access to sustainable careers by 2025. And that's really what's coming out of this is the, the public and private sector really need to work together to find solutions to ensure that people have access to the services and supports we're we're helping people empower themselves you know they just they need access to the services that exist and we're helping them get there and we need to be working together so that we are filling the the job openings that are out there and also recognizing the talent that exists for hiring that it might not be a, a traditional hire that you shouldn't necessarily look for someone with a college degree. You have to look at the skills that are out there. I think you're onto something there because what we're seeing is that learning has to be more focused on how an individual learns, number one, and more customized to their their orientation to work and life and so forth. And if we're not getting that, then we're missing the talent. We're not taking advantage of the talent that's in our society. And of course, there have been maybe screens that we have over our eyes that have excluded certain people from opportunities to thrive in our society that we are hopefully hopefully beginning to lift now. I mean, I think about people who've been incarcerated for minor offenses, right? who for whatever reason, can't get a job because they have that on their record. Well, they've paid their debt to society. Shouldn't we be doing what we can to get them back in the workplace? So there, there are all of these artificial barriers that we have to getting people opportunities that we need to look at and see if there are ways of eliminating so, so we can get people through and into ways of helping our society and ways of helping themselves. You know, I used to be in the workplace space some years ago. And one of the things that we were always able to say was that if we were able to get maybe even a third of the people successful in our programs, just a third of the people, it would more than pay for the two thirds that we weren't able to succeed with. When you think about the fact that they might have ended up incarcerated and what we pay for that. Right. That they may have ended up on public assistance and what we would have paid for that. Or they may have been criminals and what we pay for that, just from the standpoint of the cost associated with the crime they produced. And when they get these jobs, they're able to pay taxes, take care of their families, put a future generation in a place where they can be viable as well. So the the benefits, even if we were able to get about a third of the people successful, more than paid for what we were able to, the cost of the program, so to say. And I, I would imagine that those numbers are still solid today because it's so powerful when you can get a person employed and oriented to work. Right. And I'm really glad that you brought up people with criminal backgrounds specifically We just started working with Accenture on a program that we're calling Project Overcome, and it started off as a pilot. We've now expanded in additional markets, but it's all about ensuring that people with criminal backgrounds feel comfortable. So it's a virtual reality program 
where they practice interviewing and just are able to build their confidence so that they can excel in the interview process and be able to translate their skills in the interview, recognizing that they've they've had that gap, that they feel comfortable talking about their background. And we have seen a lot of success with that particular program, but that's just one way because they they need that extra level of support to help them translate the the strength that they bring to the table and and while they how they'll be a good hire and also make them feel comfortable during that time of transition. Yeah. Lauren, I want you to switch just for a minute back to the importance of communications in nonprofits because honestly, I don't think many people understand the significance of strong communications. I want you to talk about why that's important. And I also want you to talk about some of the shortcomings that nonprofits may have in that regard that may hold back their ability to actually achieve their mission. So I, communications is an integral part of nonprofits. And I, if I look at just my role, for instance, I have three audiences. There's the external audience, the national audience, the internal audience within my team, my office, and supporting them in their work. And then there's the member network. So that makes it a little bit more complicated. So anyone that is in a member federated model, like a United Way or Goodwill, There is that level of complexity because in some ways I feel like I am serving as a a PR agency of sorts to help my, the members excel uh, and deal with if it's an issues management situation or if it's telling a story in their local market. So that's, that's something to, that's really important to consider. And then when you think of PR, PR is very nuanced our work is very reliant on other people to ensure success. And I always harp on the need for stories and the need for data so that I can get a story out there. Pitching itself is so time consuming and there's a lot of cultivation that goes into those relationships. Reporters themselves get thousands of pitches every day. So you really you really have to have those relationships built up over time so that you're serving as a source, even if it's giving that reporter another story that doesn't deal with your organization, but you're serving as a resource to them. But you also, you have to have that that compelling story of what is unique or different or counterintuitive. That That's something that I always harp on. And then there's not always that PR in itself is different because there's not always that instant gratification or immediate results. You can run an ad and you can know exactly what it amounted to in terms of impressions or or people reached. But with PR, it's very different because you have work that builds up over time. For example, I was working with a U.S. News Enrolled report reporter since last summer, and that story just ran two weeks ago. So that's what it took, uh, you know, all the the answering of the questions and the back and forth and ensuring that he saw a mission in action. And it's all worthwhile in the end. But I think what people don't see is that kind of behind the scenes that goes into the crafting of a compelling story and working with specific media outlets that are going to reach your, that are not only top tier, but going to reach your target audiences and then result in an end, in an action. So our call to action for Rising Together, for instance, is we want partners and funders to come to us. It's not a B2C campaign. It's a B2B. It's business to business. And we also want funding to come from that. 
So I know that in the end, it's worth it. And I'm hearing other funders come to the table and say, well, we want this type of exposure too. But to your point, I think what might not be understood is just the level of effort that's required as part of that. Yeah, for sure. And without it, people don't hear about your organization. And frankly, they don't believe you're relevant. <laughs> you know, that's the other the other challenge we have. And we also have the splintering of the media now. You know, when I grew up, there are maybe four channels, four or six channels, and there are hundreds and hundreds of channels and outlets and their podcasts like this one and right and uh, social media posts that we have to to contend with and all of these are splintering the attention of our target audiences and we have to find ways to reach them and we have to be good at reaching them wherever they are and I know it's so challenging for a public relations professional to be able to manage all that Right. You're exactly right. You would think probably 10, 20 years ago, placing an op-ed was really the way to go about getting attention for a specific issue. But I would argue that it's just not worth the time and effort that goes into the writing of that and the pitching for whatever what is really uh, competitive real estate. So to your point, Podcasts are the new medium. I just started working with a group called Pod Chaser, so we could really look at having our spokespeople be on more podcasts because of that important audio medium. And then just also people's lack of attention spans. So ensuring that whatever content you're putting out there is short and pithy enough to get your message across. And if it's a video, for instance, that's longer than five minutes, it's that it will just get lost. Those are important things to be thinking about. Well, Lauren, as we get to the end of this, I want to ask you about what you see in terms of the future of goodwill as it comes out of the pandemic. What are your what is your prognosis? What are people inside of your organization thinking about where the organization is headed and what lessons you've learned? And also just say to you, from your standpoint as a public relations professional, what additional value do you believe you need to add in order to help the organization achieve that future? Those are all really good questions. I would say communications is, again, such a huge part, and it's really looking at for instance, with Goodwill and going back to the the skills gap, who do we partner with? So we are doing that kind of push-pull effort. Is it, do we get featured in, in certain books or publications or trade publications? So, or is it partnering with an organization so we can leverage their social platforms SHRM is one example that they're very like-minded in what the work that we do. There's a lot of commonalities. So there's a real opportunity. I just booked our CEO at SHRM 22, which is their annual conference. And looking at groups like that, where you can really have shared opportunities on the, on their properties to be able to reach talent managers and employers. So when you look at communications as a whole, you could be doing that through every demographic that you're you're trying to reach. Goodwill's going through a transformation right now. We have we have to think about especially with e-commerce how we're changing in that regard. People there's now a lot of competition out there between Stitch Fix and and other online shopping sites. And so we have to think about our brick and mortar and, and how we are more innovative in reaching the online digital space consumers and Gen Z and the next generation of shoppers and donors and and how we're showing the correlation between 
buying at our store and also mission. And, and so that's what I predict is we'll, we'll be changing our e-commerce moving forward so that we get more of that retail res- support. That's our bread and butter. That revenue is really the foundation for how we can provide our services and supports. Well, Lauren, I really appreciate you giving me this time today to do this podcast interview. I've learned so much about your organization that I didn't know. And I'm really happy that you were able to also help people appreciate the importance of public relations and communications, both inside and outside of a nonprofit, so that people understand the relevance that the organization has in achieving a particular mission. And I want to say to all of our listeners, I want to thank you for listening. And if this is your first time, please subscribe to the podcast so that you can get all future episodes. We are a weekly. Every week we come out with a new episode. And I know that in these episodes that come out, you're going to find at least a moment or two of inspiring dialogue that may help you think about how you want to give back to our society. If you'd like to support the podcast, please do so by going to our website, give.org, and you can make a donation. Or you can also make a donation through Patreon to the Heart of Giving podcast. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.